welcome to the Game Informer Show. I am your host, Ben Hansen, and I'm joined by permanent co-host Timothy Turry. Oh, uh, hello. He's Can never I... going anywhere. No, no, I'm here. I no mean... way out. We also have the great Ben Reeves. Permanent Ben Reeves. That's right. And the fleeting Brian Vore. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> you might walk out halfway through this thing. It's true. So Dust welcome. in the wind. <laughs> Absolutely. Welcome to all Halo fans to this kind of expanded special edition podcast. Like normally for cover story trips, we always have one podcast that is a lot of questions from the community where we mm -hmm. call up the developers and ask them directly. This one we kind of blew out into a big old Halo special. Halo mm -hmm. spectacular. Right. Spectacular. Sure. I guess it is. If you're not a Halo fan, get out. That's right. Get the F out. So wait, no wait, come back. You might find no. something interesting. Yeah. <laughs> it is it is a good show though. We're gonna change your mind yeah, about yeah, Halo. Yeah, yeah we're gonna like it. loop Most, it all around on you. I get a sense that a lot of people like Halo. Is that yeah. fair I to say? Heard that. I think it's doing pretty yeah. good. Yeah. So second segment, we do not have a typical email section because all of the emails and all the stuff from the community were kind of funneling into the Halo lens. So we're asking the developers a lot of questions from the community, but we talked to them about the removal of split screen, kind of get some teases about whether or not the flood's going to be in the game, uh, stuff like that that I think fans will appreciate. And then the final section, I think it's my favorite interview we've done on the podcast so far, Tim. I don't know how you feel wow. about it. We have to put it right up against our interview with 343. Right. Uh, but I, it was a really good chat with, uh, um, it was Marty O'Donnell and Jamie, Jamie Griesmer hmm. uh, from their new studio, Highwire. Just kind of talking about the old Bungie days, you know, everything from like the dark days of Halo 2 to like, tell us the story about how the pistol got so overpowered again. Uh, right. And, and, and you know, just touching on all that stuff uh, up to like their time to leave uh, Bungie, which they left at different points. And yeah. So Marty Jamie worked on uh, Infamous Second Son as well. Right. He became the lead designer in that, but he was uh, a lead designer for the earliest Halo titles. And then Marty obviously is the composer. We talked to him about the weird origins of the Halo theme. I don't think I'd ever heard that story from about... No, I was really... I'd never heard it either. Yeah. What? I can't wait to listen to you this, You guys are getting guys. me hyped for yeah. this segment. Come on. Yeah. You guys should definitely When stick. does this thing come out? Come on. <laughs> right now. Stay tuned, man. It'll be great. Uh, but to start out, I want to talk a little bit about the cover story trip that you both yeah. went on. Also, uh, video editor Wade went on it as well. has been producing videos. Be sure to check out our hub. There's been a ton of stuff that we've been rolling out throughout the month. But, Brian, is this like your fourth time to 343? Hmm... I would say, yeah, we're somewhere around there. Um, this is obviously the uh, the building where um, Bungie used to reside when right, they were so you, still making Hol or still making Halo. So I was right. there for um, Halo Three ODST, which was called Recon at that point. We put Recon on our cover, and they're like, you know what? Cover in yeah. silver. <laughs> Just kidding. Got that <laughs> nice tone on there. But we uh, even talk about that actually in the Jamie and Marty interview about that switch. Do oh really? Yeah. Oh, oh man, oh, <laughs> we got to get in on this interview. Um, but yeah, I, I've, I've been there uh, for Reach. Um, we went there together, Ben, yeah. for Halo 3 for the review. This is my second time here, and both times I've gone, I've gone with Brian. Okay. Just so how was the studio? We went for yeah. the review of 3? And uh, three yeah. yeah. That's right. And then uh, Halo 4 was when uh, 343 kind of took it over. And now We went there for twice Halo for Halo 4. We went there for like an early couple of video interviews, oh. which is really weird. It's just you and I. That's right, with uh, with Frank O'Connor and Bonnie Ross, right? Right, we did two separate interviews just talking about their vision for Halo. It was and a this weird... was separate from the cover story? Yeah, it was on the tail end of our PAX trip, which yeah. you were on, Reeves. Oh, uh, yeah, I remember that. So it all So I was there, I just didn't go to that meeting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that meeting was just in their like, front little side interview room, not allowed anywhere right beyond that yeah, it was a very it was like we would ask is master chief in this game like well we're not really talking about that well, yet you know mm. they were super secretive of their just offices in general when bungie was there when i was there the first oh, time yeah. like they wouldn't let me in the back they wouldn't let anybody go Didn't they use point. the restroom <laughs> it's like here's go outside and pee in this cup isn't there some story about oh. somebody putting a backwards master chief helmet on brian that's right yeah. what happened here that was one of my that was maybe my second or third cover story ever or something and i actually had to put on i believe it was an ODST helmet where the visor was blacked out and they just kind of led me around. And blast shields were down. Yeah. Yeah. So to, you wouldn't uh, see any secrets on the development floor is the idea? That's right. And I went back to like a different like trailer room. They've got it all uh, figured out now so that, you know, they don't, they've got everything that's secretive or apparently yeah. is, is not on the walls or whatever, or they have some like trailer room that doesn't involve walking through the development floor. They're a lot more open about it too now and we did like a studio tour video and Wade got a bunch of like video footage of the studio. Oh, right on. So it's very, hear. very different than, than that, those yeah, times. Yeah. Changing times. So but uh, it's, it's cool. Like this is like only part of 
the studio now. Like, I don't know if it was always there, but this time was the first time I got to check out the other building yeah, as well. Yeah, that's like a building. Where you kind of walk from one to the next. They're pretty close to each other. Is but, that kind uh, of like the Master Chief Collection building, or is that not that easy of a divide? I don't know how they have it broken up, but I, I know they have like m- different marketing people in one building and like sure. different developers in the audio team yeah. in a different one. And so... Yeah, I yeah. I think it's more by department than like game. Right. It's tough right. to have all that room too. It seems like anyone who's making Halo in that original building he keeps outgrowing it and outgrowing it. What's really funny is they have tons of umbrellas between because it's yeah. Seattle. So it's total rain. You always there's always uh, like an umbrella within arm's reach if you ever have to go outside between these two buildings. <laughs> really living the life of luxury. Oh, so gosh. on right. the Halo Four cover trip where I was up there, uh, Josh Holmes was the creative director. That's right. Um, and now it's switched you mean over. James Holmes? <laughs> Shut up. That's a joke for later, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Just and, a little taste. <laughs> that's right. And then now it's Tim Longo. And I was that's excited right. to talk to Josh Holmes because he was the director for NBA Street, which is probably <laughs> yeah. my favorite sports game. Well, well, such really? an obvious connection between. Right. Not NBA yeah. Jam, huh? Big sports no. guy. I, I like NBA Street more than NBA Jam, yeah. All right. uh, wow. But then Tim Longo, who's in charge nice. now, uh, he was the creative director early on in the Tomb Raider reboot. Um, when it kind of had the, more of a horror tone and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he was also the creative director for Republic Commando. That's which right. I'm excited about. So yeah. we talk a little bit about that in the interview. The original out. Republic Commando. And he went back to LucasArts from Tomb Raider. That's right. To work on a mystery FPS oh, yeah. project. And was that the weird kind of 0.5 Battlefront where they were releasing? Remember all that footage was released where it was just no vehicles? Was it that one? We spent 10 minutes talking to him, like tiptoeing around the subject, like, hey, can you give us like any little info? And he wouldn't, he wouldn't crack. Like, I thought, so he didn't oh, really yeah, give yeah. us much, but. I, I always guessed it was a first person MOBA with LucasArts characters, uh-huh. you know, Guybrush yeah. versus yeah. Sam. I'm sure that's right. I don't know. I, w- I would assume. Yeah, probably would have been shooters. They would hire the original Republic Commando dude, yeah. maybe to do something in that universe again. I yeah. thought, I thought it was, maybe I, this is a stretch, but it wasn't like. Something about Empire Commando or something. Anyways, that's not important. But yeah, I'm curious. Playing Halo Five at the studio, fair amount. Mm-hmm. You played some campaign, and then also playing Warzone at E3. What stood out to you guys? What surprised you about those two experiences? Uh, it was f- fun. I mean, we don't always get to play games at the studio, so it was obviously nice to play. And they were like pretty willing to be like, "Hey, you guys want to play it again? You want to play it again?" And so we played through like three or four times. And what and exactly was it? Player. What section? It was. A section uh, that we haven't seen anywhere. It's like so the video is not online, but it's like uh, Master Chief team. They it's like one of the first or second levels in the game. Yeah, the you level like is called in. Blue Team, and uh, you control the Master Chief side of things. At E3, we saw that Locke and Fire Team Osiris going on a mission, to kind of tracking mm-hmm. down Master Chief. Right. Um, but this mission was all about Chief and his team. And we this is like it. before Chief even goes AWOL, so it's really, really okay. Yeah, he's still like in talks with UNSC, like going on a mission for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and we got to play not only all separately in a single player sense, but we also teamed up and went through a couple times in co op, which was really cool to see the differences there. Um, you think the squad stuff a- works well uh, if you're just playing by yourself? Is it too much banter? No, I yeah. no. Not at all too much banter, uh, which was interesting because um, Frank O'Connor had some line when we were at the studio about like, this game has more dialogue from all these characters than any of our, the rest of our extended, you know, universe stuff combined. Mm. And I'm like, what, really? Because when you're playing it, you're like, they're not like chattering at you all the time. Uh huh. It's There's like a couple lines here and there. It's Does like that include normal... the transcribed podcast? Is that part of the <laughs> yeah, factor? Probably, what, yeah, probably, You know, the, the Halo campaign's always been defined by like awesome gameplay. Uh, the shooting's always great. Co-op's awesome. But like it also has usually some cool big moments or you see some giant structure or huge enemy or anything. Was there anything that really stood out to you from that section of the campaign you played? This was all took place on the, was it Argent Moon Space Station? Okay. So you don't really expect like oh my God, I'm going to see a huge halo ring or some kind of crazy skybox thing. However, um, what seemed like kind of a small contained space uh, at first eventually opens up to this humongous hangar thing, which yeah. is a really huge like vertical and deep space um, where you're just, you can like snipe across this just gigantic area. And now with your kind of new thruster uh, pack, like the Spartan uh, abilities okay. that, you ha- that you saw in uh, the beta, that also, of course, uh, works on campaigns. So you can use that to really maneuver around all these areas. And the enemies have like jump enhancement too. So they're just like 
flying through the air at you. Yeah. Okay. Into the air, you can do like, your Spartan smash where you like charge up and like slam against the ground and kill dudes. And like that was probably the most satisfying thing is doing that repeatedly to, to enemies. And the higher you are, are you up, the more distance you can cover horizontally as yeah. well. So you can really just use it to kind of skip ahead a lot of the map too okay. if you're really up high. And it feels basically like the Spartans do in the multiplayer beta then? Yeah, they yeah, tweaked so. the controls since the beta, so it's actually easier to do that smash now, um, huh. which is nice. Sure. But it's still really fun. What did you guys think of Warzone at E3? You know, what was fun is while we were at the studio, actually, like halfway through the day, they started whispering to us, like, you know, we got something a little bit secret to show you guys later, you know, keep, you know, we got this big thing is coming up. And then like an interview or two later, it's like, yeah, I think we're going to show you this thing. Like they kept like, what is this thing? It's like, you can't talk about it in the cover story. We'll show you Master Chief's eyebrows. But we want to show mm-hmm. you. And then we got into this what room at the end of the day. <laughs> And uh, it was Warzone. And so they actually showed us Warzone at the studio. Okay. But you guys were under embargo. And we were under embargo, so we couldn't talk about it until E3. But we got to play it there at the studio, and then we also played it at E3. Um, So this is like the gigantic map. Yeah, it's like 24 24 people. And tons of different vehicles. And I've also heard that it's a little bit like MOBA inspired, just with like the creep out there. 12 on 12. They did not use the word MOBA, but I could see MOBA influences. It's like a dirty word for some studios, you know, depending on like what audience you're going for. Sure. Well, you start out and you're on a team of 12 and you have a base and the other team has a base, but then there's other bases throughout that you can try to like capture. Mm -hmm. And then AI, like defense Marines will spawn and sort of be on your team. But then there's also like AI enemy, like Spartans and, or not Spartans, but like protons. Bosses. Yeah, yeah, it's like floating around. Like protons and electrons. Protons and electrons. Uh, yeah. And there's, and it's different levels too. Like there's these like kind of wimpier guys that'll get you like these 25 points. There's bigger ones that give you 200 points. It's all with the goal of getting to 1,000 victory points. And you can huh. get those by capturing stuff. You can get them by killing bosses. You can get them by uh, shooting other players. There's a lot of options there, and everyone kind of starts out the same. Um, and you, I guess, kind of the MOBA-ish part. I don't feel too MOBA-ish. I don't get too much of a MOBA vibe from this. But one part is just like the in-match leveling. Everyone starts at zero, and the more oh. you do, you kind of level up and get these like different level points to spend. And the rec cards... Uh, that you collect over time uh, for gif- like different power weapons, different vehicles and stuff. Um, you can save them up for like a huge thing, like a giant mantis mech and really mm-hmm. go to town on people. Or if you just want to like get rolling with like a really powerful sniper rifle or a rocket launcher, you can maybe spend the two points and just get, keep going with that. Um, so we it saw really a new weapon or sorry, a new vehicle called the Phaeton, which is like a right. giant hovercraft thing that like can do this like teleport dash across the field and it's a unsc cool. weapon or vehicle that's it's a, a prothean prothean okay. um sorry not it's not a weapon it's a it's like a giant or prothean tank. i'm sorry right right <laughs> yeah yeah um but it's really devastating so you can save up and that's like a giant like reward hmm. so. so are you guys more interested or which do you think is a bolder move for halo uh breakout which is the new seems like more counter-strike quicker multiplayer mode that was in the beta or warzone i'm more excited for warzone and honestly like I've always liked Halo's multiplayer, but I've always been more of a single player guy. Sure. More interested in that, like contained experience. But Warzone actually got me excited. Like, I remember walking away from that first time we played it, and I was like, you know, I want to dive in there again because it felt like when I play multiplayer, if I suck, like, I just feel defeated and down on myself. But when I was playing this, like, you know, I felt like there was more. I don't work on the game, I'm not trying to sell it, but I actually was excited (laughs) because there was always something for me to do. Like, I could shoot enemy AI and feel worthwhile. It's the Splatoon effect. I yeah, yeah. Or yeah, Titanfall. Or, yeah, yeah. It's exactly. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, give us sucky people something to do. Right. <laughs> Those of us who can't uh, kill anybody who actually plays the game every day. Correct. Well, good. I'm glad you guys had a good time playing uh, these two modes and the campaign and everything like that. Um, I am excited for Halo fans to listen to this entire episode. I think there's going to be some good stuff out there. Yeah. So stay tuned for a big old interview with Tim Longo and Josh Holmes from Thief 3 before diving into Jamie and Marty from the old Bungie days. Yeah. We got something for everybody. And, and we'll get back to your uh, your emails next week. Yeah. Uh, and so we got some backlogged and then the rest, uh, you know, you can send to podcastgame4.com and we'll, we'll answer your questions next week. Definitely. All right. Stay tuned, everybody.
All right, and welcome back to the Game Informer Show. We are honored for this section to be joined by two of the heads of Halo 5 Guardians' development. We have Josh Holmes, who is the studio head of internal development. Welcome, Josh. And then we also have Tim Longo, who's the creative director for Halo 5. Hello. And I'm trying to think, you guys have both been on this podcast before in different times, right? I don't think I've done this podcast. Okay. I was on for Tomb Raider. That's reboot, right. Um, back ways, quite a ways. Yeah, congratulations oh, yeah, on how that then. game turned out, by the way. Yeah, good job. <laughs> awesome team. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Great. Well, we have a bunch of questions from the community here. Um, the passionate Halo fans out there have some burning questions for you guys. So we're just going to run down those kind of in a rapid fire kind of way. So if you're ready to kick things off. Great. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Um, right, take it away. Our first category today is uh, all about campaign. Um, uh, the first uh, first question is from Zabala. This is all from our, our, our readers on GameInformer.com. Yeah. Um, these are all our usernames. And he wants he or she wants to know, will there be an even balance between playing Master Chief and Spartan Lock? So we, yeah, we haven't, we haven't talked about yet sort of the exact ratio. Um, our, our campaign experience is very crafted for, you know, showing the two perspectives of Chief's saga. And so it definitely goes back and forth between the two. And it's very specific about why you're, you know, seeing through the eyes of each of the two um, of the two characters. But we kind of want to, we don't want to give away too much about what's going on there. So we've been kind of hush-hush about the exact kind of play out of how that, how that works specifically. I, th I think one of the interesting things for us, um, you know, is we wanted to really examine the chief a little bit more closely with this story. And chief's not the sort of person who's going to uh, that's going to be kind of self-reflective. And so, in a lot of ways, we we wanted to use that um, that external perspective of Locke to more closely examine the chief. So it's kind of like he's a lens that we can use to look more closely at Chief, and, and that's really interesting. So whether you're playing from the perspective of Chief or the perspective of Locke, the focus is always on Chief and his story. Was this from the very outset of the project? You guys knew that you kind of wanted to go back to the Halo 2 style of a split campaign? I, don't, I mean, we definitely talked about the... the um, like the the parallel there, but I think it, it started from the perspective of, hey, we we want to tell this story, um, and we want to tell it in a bit more of a mysterious way, and and Locke was a device that we could use as well as being you know really interesting and compelling character mm -hmm. in, in his own right. Yeah, I, I think yeah, I think it was twofold. It was the mystery, which which again is why we sort of had that that lens. To see uh, to to see Chief's journey through through Locke and through Team Os uh, Fire Team Osiris, but on the flip side, which you know we've we've talked a bit about as well, is we're we want to intentionally expand the universe too, and we want to give players, um, you know, new Spartans, new main characters to play as, and so there was a really intentional goal there with Fire Team Osiris as well, and then bring in classics like Blue Team back, so you get to actually play as both. It wasn't like you know, really necessarily drafting off of Halo 2 specifically, but Halo's a, a big universe, you know, with a lot of different characters, so we figured why not, you know, you know, insert these kind of new, fresh faces as well. I think the decision to go with the two four-player teams and really focus on that um, cooperative experience, um, that was pretty foundational in the approach. And, you know, as Tim mentioned, oh, like, yeah. once, once we started looking at that, then it sort of felt natural. Hey, here's blue team um that is this beloved group of of characters that have been explored in the extended fiction how do we bring them into the fold and make them um, a part of the experience and again in keeping with that whole idea of how do we explore chief more closely it's like if you surround him with characters that he cares about and that he knows um and that know him very closely uh, that just gives us more opportunities as storytellers I think a lot of people, when they heard that Tim was on this project and then found out the way that the campaign was structured, they're like, oh, it's kind of harkening back to the Republic Commando roots. Like, you're just the squad guy. Is there any connection there in your mind? Uh, well, I will, I mean, I'll definitely say that 
Republic Commando, there's influences there, but I, I have to, I mean, I have to be honest that the team, even before I came onto the team, the team had notions that were towards squad sort of, um, you know, direction, which was, ended up being something that was very exciting for me coming in. Um, I came in kind of at the end of the concept phase of the project um, or in the middle of that. And so it, it was a natural fit, I guess, because it's really near and dear to my heart. And kind of one of my favorite ways to play a shooter is a squad, squad having a squad element. Um, and yes, uh, Republic Commander comes up from time to time when we are developing the game for sure. And there's, there's influences there, but I, I mean, I can't reinforce enough that there's a lot of goals that five has that are really coming from Spartans and the UNSC and the sense of having a team, um, it really fits really well. And I think, I think it's something that Halo's, you know, you know, with reach and, and others, there's, there's been some of that flavor that's always been around. Right. And we're, we're kind of doing the next evolution of that and kind of owning it when it comes to that four-player co-op and having those characters persistent with you the whole time yeah. and that everyone can play as them, you know, the whole time, which Republic Mano didn't have co-op, right? Which um, which this is sort of a big, cool evolution for, for that. I yeah, think definitely. that was one of the things when we looked at Reach as a game, you know, you had these other Spartans that were surrounding, um, were surrounding Noble Six and, and um, we were kind of, uh, we're kind of thinking like, why, why can't I play as those characters? You know, when you're in co-op, it just felt like a natural um, experience to want to play as one of those other characters. I want to be George, you know, I want to be Kat. Um, and so I think when we were starting on the concept for, for five, that was something that we really wanted to, to be able to bring to life as an experience. And I think when, when we're talking to Tim, it, that's where there was just a natural fit. You know, when you're looking for someone that can come in and lead the team creatively and you kind of have an, an idea of where you want to take things, um, it just there becomes a synergy between um, between Tim, Tim and the team creatively where we wanted to go in places where I think Tim brings a lot. Um, from his Republic Commando yeah. experience. Definitely. Cool. Well, we have a lot of questions here. We should keep on rolling. Yeah, yeah. We'll let the readers uh, ask a few. Uh, <laughs> well, we got Choppy next. Uh, they ask um, about removing split screen, split screen from the game. Uh, it's kind of been a long tradition. There were, like, every third question was about this. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure you guys are getting it a lot on, the, you know, Waypoint and all your, all your channels as well. Yeah, I mean, you know... Making the decision to remove split screen was a really tough one um, for everyone here at 343 uh, on the team. Uh, it's not something that we took lightly, but we were really focused on, you know, this experience that we're trying to deliver, the, the epic scale um, of both the campaign and then also the, the new multiplayer experiences that we're creating, like Warzone, where we're just delivering things in a way that's so much larger than than anything that has existed in Halo past. And then looking at, you know, the, the experience that we're trying to create and the, the fidelity of that experience, the compromises that would need to be made um, in order to to support split screen were just compromises that we weren't um, willing to make. We didn't feel like it would do justice to the experience, um, but it definitely was, you know, it was a tough decision for us. Uh, let's see, um, Dragon Lord one one two three uh, wonders if uh, Chief and Locke will visit a lot of the same planets or locations, or will they kind of be off doing their different things? Um, <clears throat> well, so you know, one of the cruxes of the story that we've you know we've been talking about and and um, getting a little bit into is you know there's this Chief and Blue Team go AWOL, you know, and and they're kind of off the grid and. Um, have left the UNSC for mysterious reasons early in the campaign. And so there's a little bit of this kind of manhunt feel. So when it comes to where, you know, there's a chase on and Fireteam Osiris is tasked to go after them. So of course they're going to hit the same locations. And we're kind of putting, as Josh mentioned earlier, putting the pieces together about the two different perspectives of what's going on in the story. So yeah, you know, they're following Blue Team, so they're going to come upon their you know, similar location and then see uh, what happened, you know, um, after the aftermath of Blue Team being there and then following in their footsteps and the mystery kind of unfolds in there. So, yeah, that's actually one of the big goals for us is to kind of see, again, these locations. Um, a lot of them are new and have never been seen before, um, all of the, the planets really, uh, and uh, see them from both perspectives. 
and uh, and both squads are so different in their characterizations and how they deal with situations that it's kind of cool to see each of these new planets from their sides of the story. So yeah, definitely. But as much as as much as the the two teams are you know kind of crossing paths or, or following in in footsteps, it's not you're not going back to the exact same mission and yeah. playing it from the other team's perspective. It's not like a bunch of um, backtracking throughout the, the campaign. It's no. still each one of those experiences is very specifically crafted for that. Yeah, that's a good point. Story yeah. No, they, they all each have their own missions on the, on the, I mainly mean from the planet kind of macro perspective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, Tears of LA wants to know, I think oh, with the co-op. <laughs> Oh, we lost you for we a lost second. You for oh, no. oh, okay. You, no. you got it? Okay. We're uh, still here. All right. Nick, Tears of LA wants to know, um, uh, will Chief and Locke be, when you're playing single player, obviously you're surrounded by a team at all times, um, but they want to know if they can kind of pick alternate team members outside of Chief and Locke to, like, if I want to play Buck or something, like, if they can do that in single player, or is that a multiplayer only thing? So that's something that you can do in multiplayer co-op. Um, so, you know, anytime uh, a player starts a co-op session, they take control of the lead hero, which would be either chief or lock, depending on the mission. And then as they have friends that come in and, and join their session, um, they're able to select from the other members of the squad and, and decide, you know, do I want to play as Buck? Do I want to play as uh, Tanaka? Um, and do I want to play as Kelly? Um, so that's something that is is a selection that's available for uh, additional players, but always the lead hero that we wanted to make sure that, that the primary player is controlling mm -hmm. that hero. Mm -hmm. Did you guys have trouble like landing on those four characters for Locke's team? Did you have like everybody on the team was like championing like a different like person from the extended universe? Like, oh, I want to see this person in the game. Oh, for, for, for Locke's team? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was it was actually a pretty cool process. Um, obviously, we brought Buck back um, as sort of you know fan favorite and and kind of uh, he was elevated to Spartan status and all that kind of stuff. So that was it. Ended up being sort of a natural a natural one. But like I was saying earlier, um, we have a a pretty big goal across three for three of expanding the universe. And for Tanaka and Vale, you know, those are brand new characters they're not even from extension extended fiction technically and we've we've uh, um, rallied behind you know some of the comic stuff introductions and some of the novels and things but the game was sort of driving that really and um, Locke as well is the same case right we're creating a new character um, so it's it's always nerve-wracking and crazy to create new main characters that you play as because you have like you have chief and and blue team kind of they're already established so how do you live up to that but I, I feel like the team did a pretty good job at finding interesting you know um, interesting unique characters that that are I think people are gonna really dig and really be into and we already have some of them are already growing um, with you know to become favorites on the team as well you can see where everyone's favorites mm -hmm. are of course, Buck is very popular yeah. Yeah. Uh, with everybody, and I think we saw that even at E3. But uh, but Vale and Tanaka are, are pretty badass as well. So. I think I think there's an interesting um, contrast between the two teams and a and a deliberate one. Like we kind of started with the two heroes and saying, how do we create a contrast to Chief in Locke? But then when you look at the teams, Blue Team are are so connected to one another, and and they're so um, they're they're just such a, a mm. unit. And we wanted to create in Fireteam Osiris this idea of like a brand new team that's still learning how to work together and have very Contrast. different contrasting personalities <clears throat> and maybe a little bit more conflict on the team than uh, than you'll see with Blue Team. Yeah, that's a good point. Hmm. Very cool. Cool. Well, this one also came up, uh, or a variant of this also came up a whole lot, and I'm sure you guys have heard it a bunch. Uh, STL Yashi uh, wants to know... Uh, we know Halo 5 will feature the Covenant and the Prometheans, but will there be anything involving the Flood? Will my favorite enemy be in the game at all? Well, who's his favorite enemy? I don't think he really clarified that. <laughs> Himself. Yeah. Oh, you want to handle? Yeah, there's no Flood in the game. Yeah, yeah we're not dealing with the Flood uh, in this one. We got uh, other surprises in store. So. Okay. Very cool. Oh, Very cool. It's mysterious. Um, Mendonca95 wants to know very specifically uh, if we will hear anything about Spartan Naomi 10. Mm. Um, 
Well, I mean, I don't, I don't think you're going to see Naomi in this game, um, but definitely a character that we may revisit in the future. Hmm. Very cool. Very cool. When did you guys first start talking to uh, Nathan Fillion about being in the game? Was he pretty on board? Pretty excited to be a Spartan this time? Yeah, I mean, he was. He's been a fan of the series for years. Um, I, he actually was telling us the story of how he he got. Uh, what was it? He, he basically was lifting something. I think it was a couch or something. I'm totally going to butcher this story, but he ended up throwing out his back, and he was like laid up uh, at home, and ended up just playing marathon sessions of Halo. Um, this is years and years and years ago, um, and that sort of got him totally hooked on on the game and then he's sort of followed throughout the the years um, as each new game has been released um, and so when we reached out to him and just sort of asked would there be any interest there he he definitely jumped at the chance to to come back and, and, and throughout his back and, again <laughs> especially once he learned that he'd be a spartan yeah that was, yeah. That was he was super excited to be upgraded to the <laughs> to the Spartan status. You know, and we and the, the, I mean, we it, the cool thing about that is that we you know we have to design his armor for that, right? There's like we go through this whole process, and we would send him concepts, you know, kind of how the the armor was progressing, and then when we got the face scan in there, we you know we sent him that stuff, and he sees the diff from ODST to now when it comes to the fidelity. So he was, you know, and it was yeah, he was super excited and and. Always interested to know how things are going. I'm yeah. assuming the Spartan version of him will be able to lift the couch a little bit more effortlessly. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's how the characters introduced in Halo 5. Yeah. That's right. Couch. <laughs> two, two couches. Look it, I'm fine. Maybe couch. that's the mysterious new enemy. Yeah. Couch revenge. Need to put a couch in the game someplace yeah. now. <laughs> Secret power. Physics couch. Yeah. Uh, so we have some questions about multiplayer yeah, now. Just uh, bang these out real quick. Just bang them out, guys. Bang them um, out. So yeah, just one from Barbetti here. Is he has a question about armor customization, and curious if um, will it be like the Master Chief Collection, where you can only select a preset permutation, or is it a little bit more like classic customizations featured in like Halo Three and Reach? So the way that the system works, it's it's deeply tied into um, the new uh, requisition system that we're implementing in the game as a reward system. And so basically, we have hundreds and hundreds of different um, variations that you can uh, use on your your Spartan to customize, and that includes things like helmets, um, uh, armor, visors, armor skins. Um, we also have stances. Assassination animations, weapon skins, um, weapon skins, obviously emblems. So we there's just a, a huge depth of things that you can customize to kind of give your Spartan your own identity, and all of those things are unlocked through the requisition system. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, we you, actually you can mix and match them as you as you see fit. Sure, we had a question about that as well from the Steve ninety six. He was actually curious if that was going to be stuff that you would update after the game came out too, like new. New wrecks would be coming out after the game, so you can continue to like add new helmets or armors or vehicles or anything. Yeah, I mean, in addition to all the content oh, yeah. that ships at launch, we also have plans to deliver hundreds of additional items post-launch. So, I mean, we we look at the requisition system as a way of continuing to deliver um, fresh content and and keep people excited about uh, the game and and keep rewarding players with new stuff. Um, and so, our I think for us this this game represents a, a pretty fundamental shift in terms of how we look at launch and post-launch. We, we have um, the most uh, ambitious plans around continued um, content delivery post-launch of, mm. of any past Halo game, um, both from the perspective of the requisition system as well as map content for, for multiplayer. Great. Sir Ping One is curious about big team battles and whether or not you're going to have those back in the game, or do you feel that Warzone kind of fills that niche? So we're really excited about Warzone. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. as a brand new mode, um, big team battle obviously you know has been a, a classic staple for the Halo for years, um, and so Warzone in some ways is is kind of an evolution of big team battle, but we also want to support classic big team battle and we have plans to um bring that online as a post-launch beat um that'll happen in the weeks after launch and uh, we want to focus on really launching 
war zone and, and, you know, having people experience that, that brand new mode. Cool. Arrested solids curious, uh, if there will be vehicle skins in the game or vehicle variations, such as like an assault mantis or like an, a great, uh, a grenade launcher mantis, stuff like that. Yeah, we have variations of vehicles that will be in there too. And like Josh says, that those are also part of the requisition system as well. Um, and, um, different themes, you know, different skins, different looks, um, and some different functionality. Some of them are super crazy and awesome and cool and, uh, probably OP at this point, but we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll tune them appropriately, but yeah, the vehicle stuff's pretty exciting. Cool. Ember McLean is curious about playable elites in multiplayer and custom games. Yeah. I, so sorry, the, the question got cut off a little bit. Is it Think, playable elites? Right. Yeah. Playable elites. Uh, it seemed like a dual question actually, cause they were curious about custom games, but then also just, uh, playable elites. Are they going to be in multiplayer? Yeah, no, we're we're focused on Spartans for Halo Five, so no playable elites in Halo Five. Um, all Spartans all the time. <laughs> elites are ugly anyway. I don't know why you'd want yeah. to be one. It sounds like there was a lot of challenge with like hitboxes the the first time around with that. And I always want to be handsome in games too. I know. So. Right. Or yeah. have a cool helmet. I want to be yeah. Ben Hansen in games. Yeah, That's yeah right. certainly. Yeah. I like to have a mirror on my gun too, so I can look at my character in first person right. as I'm running around all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <It's very important. laughs> Take selfies the whole yeah, time. These are handsome to somebody. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> that's I haven't true. met him. Beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Come on, guys. <laughs> Probably the most important question, though, is coming up. It's from Ghost Valkyrie 14 He's asking, will there be an achievement for getting a kill? The, uh, excuse me, getting a kill while Timmy the Whale is watching. What? <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, Timmy the Whale. Timmy the Whale. Oh man. That's... For the uninitiated, can you yeah. explain what the hell Timmy yeah, the Timmy Whale the... is? <laughs> My old school nickname, actually. <laughs> it wasn't great. Explain Timmy the Whale, please. Oh, uh, it's so it's so convoluted. I mean, <laughs> there's a couple so books about it. Goes, it, it Extended kind of Halo lore. Halo Four. There's a there's a character that is introduced in um, what is it? Is it Composer? I can't remember which level. Yeah. Uh, anyway, the second to last level in okay. in Halo Four, we there's a character that comes on over the PA system, and is telling everybody that they need to leave. And the character's name is Tim, and we joked that Tim would be resurrected in a in a future game, <laughs> and then the whale became this big. The, I don't know, like a an effort for the the team to create this space whale that is now featured in a couple of different places, and somehow that na- that whale got named Tim. Yeah, I don't I don't remember how it got named. Think, no no connection got, to Mr. Longo. Tim after right. Tim. Okay. Yeah. yeah, a combination of reincarnating that character and then also Tim. You as I get, Earth I, yeah, Earth Warrior. That's yeah. <laughs> I get, I get a fair amount of crap from people. I'm okay. I'm a little bit of a hippie, a little bit of an environmentalist, whatever. And so, yeah, to save the whales, blah blah blah. And so, like, oh, we'll move oh. the whale to the whale. <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. No, it's not hilarious. Don't do that. <laughs> but, but that just meant it's got to be. Yeah, that way. I shouldn't have said anything. Yeah. Uh, so now the whale is appearing all over the place, and. Uh, <laughs> It's a huge whale, so it's actually not appropriate to be everywhere, but it, it's it's awesome, and the, the team did a good, good job with it. Space whales. Space whales, yes. Right. Yeah. I love how if any game puts in an animal, it just instantly becomes a meme. Like, it started with, like, Call of Duty Goes, yeah. like, that dog is awesome. Fallout 4, people are losing their mind over that dog. And if you put a whale in one of your multiplayer maps, like, well, Apparently. there we go. <laughs> Whales are the next hot thing. They're a big companion. Well, it's, it's hilarious, too, because people will be playing, we've had people come, you know, come by and check out the game, and they're playing CTF, and they'll be running through Fathom, you know, our undersea map, and they'll start, they'll have the flag, and they'll be being chased, and they'll stop and look out the window and watch t- the whale. Oh. As, as embrace like, it. It's yeah, it's, it's just embrace it. It's like a, cease, hot, it's, it's yeah. a ceasefire as everyone just kind right. of stares <laughs> at the whale. Majesty. It's just the weird siren <laughs> song as sing. it's singing its whale and winking at you. <laughs> cool. Uh, a whale of a tail. There's an opportunity to deploy whales with oh, some position someday yeah, at some point. Yeah. 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 You just deploy oh, nice. a whale, it comes out, yeah. and you can't do anything. It just falls on people. Yeah. That sounds yeah. perfect. It just have just laser beams it. attached to its yeah, head. Big, big Hitchhikers fans. All right, uh, some miscellaneous questions now. There are a bunch of questions about these two specific topics. I know you guys aren't going too much in detail on it, but can you at least acknowledge for the fans out there that you guys see the value in the theater and Forge? 
Yeah. No, okay. Yeah, <laughs> okay, good, good. Oh, good, yeah. Can at least acknowledge that. Okay. That's as far as you're willing to go on that front? I think we're going to be talking about uh, some of the advancements that we're making for Forge, particularly in the in the coming months. It's something that we as a team are really excited about. Um, you know, we have a great Forge community that has um, contributed a lot to to Halo over the years, and and that's something that we want to continue to support. And so it's been a big focus for us to look at. Um, you know, opportunities to improve on some of the features that have been there in, in previous iterations of Forge, but also bring some new things to the table. Um, but we're not talking about the specifics. Of gotcha. That. Cool. Yeah, we have we have um, some good some heavy forgers on our pro team actually, and so we you know we we talk to them and and have been working with them to you know talk about some stuff uh, when it comes to Forge and get some you know from the experts' mouths. Cool. So Kyle Zellner, Zellner wants to know that even with the coming release of Halo 5 Guardians, will the Master Chief Collection continue to be supported with patches and playlist updates? Yeah, I mean, so the the two teams that are, there's two separate teams that work on these products, um, and there's no kind of connection between, hey, we're going to release Halo 5 that doesn't impact our support for the Master Chief Collection. They're, cool. they're two separate teams that will continue to support uh, those products Got it. Uh, in peril. Cool. Uh, Stitchman wants to know if you guys are considering a Season 2 for Hunt the Truth. Mm. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good thought. Uh, <laughs> for those not watching the video well, version of, this, of it before. Josh has never smiled bigger in his life when that question was asked. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> I, I think we've been uh, we've been really pleasantly surprised by the reception that Hunt the Truth has has received. Um, you know, it uh, it started out as something that we thought would be kind of relatively um, niche in terms mm-hmm. of you know people that would be listening. It's been phenomenally successful beyond our wildest dreams, and and so we're kind of excited about how we can continue to explore that story in future gotcha uh just on a personal note i wanted to kiss your guys's ass over the sprint that is an amazing look at the development of this game if you people aren't familiar uh it's just a very raw look at what it's like to develop at least the multiplayer sections of halo 5 and i recommend people really check it out cool that i mean the credit for that really goes to um paul featherstone um Mm -hmm. he kind of came up with the original concept i mean he's he's on our uh community and video team and he came up with the original concept where he he, uh did like a um an early kind of prototype version of it um, and pitched it and then we did the first season around the beta time frame and then based on the feedback that we saw from the community and fans um, we got really excited about continuing that and so we just had the second season came out around e3 and it's something that we'd like to continue doing in future as well i think the more that we can kind of invite the community into the development process and and share kind of what that looks like um it's something that we're really excited about yeah i'd imagine like the push for going gold that's going to be a great time to have cameras rolling in the studio as much as it'll drive you guys nuts yeah i mean it takes it takes some getting used to you know the first time that you have a camera crew kind of set up while you're trying to run a meeting people are incredibly distracted (laughs) and they're kind of like what's going on why is that camera (laughs) in my face but uh, after after a while it just sort of becomes something that feels second nature and and people learn to ignore it and then i think that's when that's when you get much more natural kind of um i don't know you catch you capture real moments which are the most interesting things it's it's one thing to kind of put together this fabricated veneer of hey this is the story we want to tell versus hey let's just embed and show people the way things actually work day to day and there's some you know, there's some uncomfortable moments in that, but I think it, it makes it more interesting. Yeah, that's the point. I, I mean, Paul is, he's basically, he's a part of the team, right? So when people see him, he has his cameras and he has, you know, the guys that are working with him. But but when he comes around, people are getting used to seeing him and they know, you know, here comes Paul. And he's super nice guy, right? And he's casual and low impact. So it makes, I think it makes people a little more comfortable, you know, because he's, 
he is, you know, he's on the team. And that's from my perspective, just, you know, speaking as someone who, you know, um, came in for, um, for Halo 5 and wasn't on Halo 4, like the concept of a studio having that kind of support all around all the time is fairly unique. And it's great that 343 is committed to that kind of stuff because it's he, Paul just, he sits not far from us and he just comes and films a meeting, you know, and, and it's super awesome to have that. And it's really kind of rare. Yeah, so, definitely. Uh, yeah, we're really we're really excited for the, those to be you know existing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's awesome. great. I love seeing studios do stuff like that. Uh, so the next question comes from um, uh, sects and violins. Uh, so that's like <laughs> religious sect plus the vi- the string right, instrument. Right. So sects okay. and violins. Very clever. Very Both clever. sell really well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right. So you've announced that all DLC maps will be made available for no extra cost. This sounds too good to be true. Um, and I'm guessing it is. So what will be offered as paid DLC? Um, so we talked about over over um, E3, and I uh, wrote a blog post on uh, Halo Waypoint. You know, our, our goal with, first of all, our goal with offering the uh, DLC maps uh, as free to everybody is we want to keep everybody playing on the same content. Mm-hmm. We don't want to divide the player base and have, you know, some people who are playing on these maps, but other players who can't and and it just you know it it sort of i think results in a in a in ideal situation for everybody so that was something that we started with as a team is you know how can we support this the other thing that we wanted to do was continue to provide new content um post-launch not just in the form of maps but also all the requisition content um that we have for the game so cosmetic things as well as new um, weapons and vehicle variants and things that continue to support the Warzone experience. Um, so that requisition system is set up so that players can earn content based on um, playing games in any of the multiplayer modes. Um, every time they rank up through their Spartan rank, they receive requisition packs that contain um, a variety of different items. Whenever they complete commendations, the same thing. And then we're also allowing players to purchase those packs if they choose to do so. Um, and so I think through the combination of those those systems, I think we we have something that's really fair and, and uh, helps support uh, the community within the multiplayer experience. Yeah. It keeps everybody on the same content. There's, there's no barriers in terms of who can play what and, and what content is available to, to players. So, Do you think that idea of unifying everything is kind of going hand in hand with what seems like from the outside your guys' big push towards breaking into the esports world heavy with Halo, with Halo 5? Do you think for the esports community you need to have a level playing field like that? Yeah, I, th- I think it's really important for, for eSports. You want to make sure everybody is playing the same maps. And if you're going to feature maps you know, around an event, for example, if we have like new maps that come out for Arena, we're going to feature those at, at an event, we want players to then be able to go online and immediately jump in and experience what they've just seen. And you know, in the past, when you have map packs, that's not possible. Mm-hmm. And in this case, um, it, it is something that... That players are able to do, and then, you know, there's a very clear distinction between Warzone as a as a brand new, um, fun, chaotic mode, and Arena, where everything is very, you know, very balanced and very much, you know, everybody has the same the same weapons that they start with. Everything is uh, even playing field, and so we, while we'll carry cosmetic stuff over. Between both modes, um, all of the gameplay impacting items that you unlock within the requisition system, those are limited just to Warzone. Gotcha. Okay, great. Uh, Thunner with a three for the E uh, says, uh, when are you guys going to let us pre-order the Halo 5 edition console that you mentioned on Twitter? Does it even still exist? He says someone named James Holm mentioned it on, on That's Twitter. That's your brother, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Who is this, James Holm? Uh, Can you speak for James like Holm? evil twin brother or something <laughs> uh we we're like sworn to secrecy around anything related to that topic until future moments in time so unfortunately <laughs> i'm i'm not allowed to talk about it i don't even think that i was supposed to my brother james wasn't supposed to say <laughs> so, well, this podcast james doesn't air until november yeah, I think. 
the way. We don't know what happened to James. Yeah, everyone yeah. follow James Holmes on Twitter, though. He's letting all the Halo secrets out. Oh, there. yeah. He's got it all. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, we have one. The, this is the last one. Right. Uh, this is George from Austria. This is a very direct uh, username. Uh, now that Warzone has been announced, do you have any other major reveals left to make before launch that will blow our mind? Hmm. Oh, that's a high bar. I know. Uh, <laughs> careful. Mm, I mean, we we always have stuff coming <laughs> until we launch, right? I mean, we got so yeah. I mean, we're, we're nothing to hit now, really. But yeah, I think we're we're going to continue talking about things as we get closer to launch. I I hope we can blow people's minds with some of those announces. But um, you know, I think we're really excited about the things that we've shown so far as well. With you know, our, our co-op focus in campaign and then uh, Warzone is the, the big focus at E3. Before yeah, I close I it out, I say that was pretty nuts just having like, for us, we had we got a chance to check out Master Chief's campaign. On stage, we got to see Locke's campaign and then the debut of Warzone and the arena beta has already been out. Like, you guys have really been putting a lot of stuff out there. That's, yeah, that's pretty nuts. And the HoloLens. Uh, the HoloLens AR, thing, yeah. That was pretty uh, cool, too. That was amazing. Interactivity with E3 was got a lot of buzz. Do you guys yeah. just ever feel like you just can't give the community enough? Like, you're giving them so much. It's like, <laughs> what else you guys got? Come on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, always a, it's, a, it's always a kind of tension for us where we don't want to spoil things. You know, we don't want to reveal too much about the story. We, don't, we want to save surprises. Um, but I think we still have a lot to talk about before launch. We want to show um, more of the breadth of the multiplayer experience. And, and that's something that you can expect to see from us in, in the coming months. Cool. Well, before speaking, we... speaking of HoloLens, oh, did yeah. you guys get a, I'm sure you guys got a chance to get like a nice uh, sweep through. Was that what was it like kind of experiencing the HoloLens Halo experience for the first time? Oh, crazy. <laughs> I mean, the, the moment that um, that I share with everybody that I've been hearing talk about it who went through as well is that it's a simple moment, actually. It's when, you know, you put the you put that headset on and then you turn the corner and you see the waypoint in real space for the first time. And you it's the waypoint from the game and it looks and it has... Um, I was talking to Jeff Kanata about it, who got to do the, got to see it as well, and he was talking about something as simple as just seeing the the little um, uh, distance tracker, right, where it shows you the distance you are from it, and as you walk toward it, that distance changes. It's just a number, hmm. but it makes it so real, and then you're like, wait a second, I am the Master Chief because I'm seeing this waypoint in the world, and then it, and then you follow it, and it goes into the room where you're supposed to go next, like. That for me was like so mind blowing because because you're you're in the game at that point. So, um, you know, at least in a conceptual way. So that was just that one little moment for me was was what kind of clinched it in that particular experience. I, I think what's interesting about Hololens as a technology is because it's it's this mixed reality experience. You know, you have you have all of the things that are going on within the the display itself, but then that's all merged with your surroundings. And so for me, I was looking at, um, you know, some of the early tests as we were building the the experience with the HoloLens team, 4E3, and we were testing it in like a, a, a building um, here in Redmond. And it, it was, you know, like you kind of mock up the space, but it's just regular office walls. Stepping into it at E3 where they had built everything out to look like you were actually on board the Infinity and having that that merging of those two different realities was crazy. It it, it blew my mind. <laughs> I got to say, it was really fun the other night seeing uh, multiplayer designer Quinn playing Halo 5 on Conan's show. Like taking over the controls and playing for him. Can you just talk about like how that lined up and like does the entire team gather around to watch the Halo Five segment on Conan? It was yeah, it was definitely something that the team was was sharing and watching. Um, not not so much in a gathering, but everybody was watching uh, from their own stations and everything once it was once it was released. It's kind of a surreal moment. Yeah, everyone's super excited. I mean, as it was, as we were prepping for it, you know, and kind of going to to the studio and stuff. It just there was, it, it's that kind of cool moment where you realize the scale of what everyone's working on, you know. And E three in general is a nice, and it was nice for that segment to actually happen. I think it was the Monday night, right, was, of, yeah. of our of our um, media briefing. So that kind of that day for the team was super, I think, cool because 
we're in the middle of it right now, right? And everyone is so heads down and so busy and there's a morale, you know, a, a morale boost there and people are like, wow, this is really a cool thing. And then having Quinn kind of sneak up there and secretly, you know, get on there, it was, it was a nice little moment of makes it, makes it real. And those segments, Conan's segments for those, th- that stuff is always so hilarious that, you know, it just, it adds, it's not as serious, right? It's just nice to, yeah. to remember that there's some things that you can have fun with. Too. Well, I guess he got a double whammy because one of his first ones was Tomb Raider then when that was released. <laughs> yeah. yeah so I wasn't at Crystal at the yeah, time. Right, I was right. I watched it after the fact. Um, but yeah, that was an interesting one to kick off. Was, yeah. was Conan <laughs> hitting on Master Chief like he was Lara Croft? That's right. So the entire segment. Yeah. Wow, yeah, okay. yeah. Watching the brutal deaths and everything. Cool. Well, that's a good place to end. Uh, I want to thank Tim and Josh for answering a bunch of community questions. I'm sure they appreciate it. We really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks for making a sweet game. Thanks for having us on. Good luck finishing it. Yeah, definitely. Great. Thanks. Cool. And then be sure to stay tuned for the next segment where we kind of dive into the history books of Halo and talk to some old school bunchy folks about the earliest days. So stay tuned for that. Welcome back to the Game Informer Show. We are honored in our interview segment here to be joined by Jamie Griesmer and Marty O'Donnell. Hello, guys. Welcome. Hey. Hello. Hi. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank thanks you. Thanks for having us on. So you guys have just announced that you have a new studio now called Highwire Games, and you're coming to us live from Marty's studio or Marty's home? Uh, it's my home, but my studio is in my home, so... I might be using this area at some point. My Perfect. piano, my grand piano is over to the right of right of me right now. Nice. So. And then Jamie's doing some coding off in your bedroom. Uh, yes, after- yeah, because Jamie's a big coder. <laughs> <laughs> cool, but just I'm, I'm designing all the time. So <laughs> gotcha. Do you want to just give the lay of the land for the new studio before we kind of dive back through uh, your history? Sure, Jamie. Yeah. So um, let's see. Uh, a while ago, like a, like a, almost a year ago, we both found ourselves. Um, without employment, uh, and we've wanted to work together again ever since the early Halo days. And so we were just out having drinks, and we started talking about like what looking together, wor- what working together would look like, and how we could um, kind of set up a studio where uh, people like us would be happy. And uh, things sort of rolled from there. Uh, we-, we obviously can't go too much into our plans for, uh, you know, the game and everything, but, um, we're definitely trying to be, uh, um, a place where veterans that have been around for a while Mm -hmm. can, um, can make the kind of games that they love to make and kind of have the creative freedom to make those games without having to get enormous and hire in 500 people and work on one game for, a ridiculously long amount of time in between. We've we've both, but you know, done lots of AAA work and AAA together and AAA studios and and uh, you know then Jamie went off and did uh, Second Son over at Sucker Punch, which was huge. And um, you know, I think we just both were kind of like, hey, is there a way to bring AAA production value and AAA design, uh, but still keep. Uh, uh, the the studio a little bit smaller, a little bit more intimate, and especially with the tools that are out there today, we feel like that that this is a real possibility. Yeah. So that was exciting to us. Uh, to, so, are you looking to like open up your own studio space then and get like 15 employees? Is that kind of the goal, or do you have any framework in mind? Yeah, yeah, that's that's about the size. I mean, to me, when I first started on the Halo team, it was I think eight or nine, and it stayed pretty small. Uh, for the beginning and then ramped up to the huge team of like 45 that shipped the first Halo. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, and that was really kind of my ideal team size. You know, it's small enough that everybody has input and everybody is talking to each other all the time. You don't have a lot of communication problems. Um, and it turned into for AAA games, you have to have a team of f- four or 500 people. And that's like a small AAA studio now. Right. And and that's not I, I just was having fun in that kind of environment anymore. Definitely yeah. not. 
<laughs> well, the, the time is right for that kind of shift. You see more and right. more developers coming over from the AAA side to to kind of just work on more kind of crafted, more like boutique projects. Yeah, yeah. and I mean, and, you know, it's funny. I, I mean, we'll see what happens. I'm not. I mean, I think there are some areas where they probably should stay. Uh, the projects itself should probably seem more boutique, mm -hmm. but I think you can actually do some pretty amazingly effective things that maybe seem even larger because of the ability to outsource and and all the the really great third party tools that are available instead of having to build everything inside your own studio which is you know the 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 way things had to be up until now you mm -hmm. don't have to do that anymore which is great yeah yeah definitely and even like i think of your history jamie recent history when we visited you for the infamous second sun trip and remember wow. that was even considered a small team uh, for making that open world, but that was still, what, 150 people maybe towards the end? Yeah, I think including all the contractors and testers, it was probably about 150. And we were competing with other open world games like Assassin's Creed or um, GTA. You know, they have a thousand people on that team. Yeah, yeah. It can't be done. It can't be done. It's so certainly not in a way that it's also fun for guys like Marty and me. Right, right. Who's a fun for? Fun for the marketing team? Fun for the heads of the company? <laughs> In their caviar, hot tubs, what's going on over there? <laughs> there you go. Is it hot exactly. tubs filled with caviar? That's right. Or, okay, gotcha. It's fun for the, the stockholders who back a winning AAA title, which, as you know, not every title that's AAA actually wins. So right. it's an interesting time in the, in the industry right now where um, some really, really large bets are being put down and not everything pays off, and uh, it, it, makes, it makes publishers a little bit more reticent to take the big bet. Definitely. So, oh, go ahead, Jimmy. I also know some people that love working on a team that big. I mean, they have really honed their craft to their the absolute best at doing, you know, ocean wave simulations, and that's all they that's all they really want to do. And that's that's fine. There's absolutely a spot for them. But Marty and I come from, you know, our, our the the studio tagline is "old dogs, new tricks," because we come from you know a long time ago when. You kind of had to be a jack of all trades and know how to do a little of everything and um, and not be specialized, right? So, in a situation where you do have the 3D programmer in charge of the wave simulation and he probably has a team of artists working for him, there's just not a lot of place for for more of a broad uh, kind of talent. Definitely. So we don't have to dive too deep into it, but on your website, uh, you list that. You're looking to kind of try out some new platforms and new experiences. Um, so is it fair to say that, I mean, when people see you two together, they think, oh, it's going to be a sci-fi first-person shooter with an awesome soundtrack. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> are you looking to really branch out uh, in the future, or do you feel like you have a specific uh, skill set that you want to carry forward? I, I think it would be... Um... So it's premature to talk too much about details, but we can sure. give you an idea of what we're not doing. Okay. What we're not doing is um, with 15 guys jumping into the pool with Halo and Call of Duty and Destiny and trying to go head to head with that kind of thing. I think we have a a much kind of broader interest than what maybe the games we've worked on would suggest, and so you know we're gonna we're gonna try to find our own our own spot, our own kind of way forward and not just try to recreate the past. Sure. Yeah. And, and I would say too, it's, it's interesting. I mean, um, starting off early, I, I remember meeting Jamie what, probably 1998 when he was 12 or something. <laughs> um, but he, he was a fan of, of myth, the fallen Lords that we were working on at the time. And, uh, anyway, by by having by knowing him from that point and at Bungie where the teams were really small, everybody was doing, you know, many things. And then like I, yes, I'm known as sort of the the music guy, but like I've always been interested in in sound design and implementation and voice directing and story, and music and how it all goes together. So the all those elements that that polish basically uh, a game experience for the player, and um, the more uh, the bigger the teams get, the more you sort of end up um, being, I'm not saying, I wouldn't say relegated, but you just don't have, the, the, the games are just too huge to have that much influence anymore. And Jamie's like a, his, his background is physics and philosophy, which I've always thought was the perfect double major for a game designer. Um, 
but that means he's his thought process brings him into involved in all sorts of things rather than just game design. He's he's his his influence is all over the place. So um, all over the place. That yeah. sounds a little messy, but we we really like the idea that everybody who's going to be on our core team is going to have the ability to, uh, you know triple threat, quadruple threat. Mm -hmm. They're going to be important during pre-production, production, production, and post-production. And people who who don't fit into that will be more on the contracting side. And that's what we're hoping gets us, you know, maybe a a new way of doing a game company. Definitely. Super exciting. So do you want to dive back into the history books a little bit with you two? Sure. Uh, Jamie, maybe you start now. Do you want to just start out talking about when you first went to Bungie, what people were working on, what the studio looked like back then, all that good stuff. Sure. Yeah. So um, actually, Marty and my history goes back to before either of us worked at Bungie. So I was in college uh, getting my incredibly financially responsible philosophy degree. Perfect. (laughs) And uh, I was also running a fan site for Myth, The Fallen Lords, which was a Bungie game before Halo. Which I, I... did as a contractor. I wasn't full time at Bungie. I was one of my contracted games. Okay. So I um, I asked to do an interview with Marty. It was not a fancy Skype interview. This was like a <laughs> over over email. And one of the questions that I asked was, "Hey, are you doing the music for Myth Two, which had not been announced yet?" Uh huh. And of course, Marty said. Yeah, we're working on the trailer right now. <laughs> <laughs> Different time. And, yeah, and so and so, you know, being an opportunistic journalist, I <laughs> said, "Hey, I don't think Bungie probably wants you to tell me this. Can I get a tour of your studio and maybe meet some of the Bungie guys?" And so, um, wait, so you're just blackmailing them to get it? Okay. <laughs> yeah, but you're unadulterated blackmail. <laughs> was kicked off by Marty's uh, kind of lack of being guarded in his in, in talking to the press and my own um, willing to parlay that into something more. And so I met some of the Bungie guys there. And even on that first tour, there was this room that I couldn't go into. Um, yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, which that's where Halo was being made. Oh, wow. And so I kept in touch with some of the guys there and eventually came on to do quality assurance, uh, which lasted for like three days before I was using the testing the tools to make multiplayer maps. Um, and then from there, they finally let me see Halo. And I was just like, look, I'm not giving my key back. So <laughs> how am I going to work on Halo? What am I going to do? So these are in like the Steve Jobs, Apple era of Halo then, right? Was it still an RTS or? Yeah, it's pre that. It's actually, I think, 1998. And it was 99 when we uh, did the Steve Jobs, Macworld, Halo announced to the world. So Jamie was there. I think I think you probably got in before it was even called Halo. I think it was still called Blam. Yeah. So um, yeah, and at at first I think it was still, I think it had changed from the RTS days. It was still sort of built on the Myth engine, but it was switched to a third person uh, sci-fi shooter yeah. with no single important character. It was just you had a bunch of different Master Chiefs running around, except they were just Spartan soldiers against aliens. Right. So Mar- as soon as the Warthog came in, then it, we knew we had something amazing. Definitely. So, Marty, what stands out to you about that era of Bungie, like the earliest days of Halo? What people don't, what do people not understand about that game's development? Um, I think what was probably most fun for me is a, like I, I I wasn't full time there, but I spent a lot of time over there. There they had uh, they had started off Bungie's first studio was down in the south side of Chicago in a really rotten part of town. I was up on the near north side called River North and I had a really nice studio, uh, you know, with the the high uh, ceilings and the blasted brick and the whole thing. So Bungie would come up, the Bungie guys would come up when we would do voiceover work and they loved our place. And so all of a sudden, the next thing I know, they were moving into a building about a block away. So, um, that was fun. And, and just being able to go down there and work with them on Halo and Myth 2 and Oni, we, they had like three projects almost going simultaneously. Um, by the time Halo really took off, I think what was most fun about it was the, the multiplayer. We were playing multiplayer all the time, especially once the first person shooter aspect came in. And, um, so that was it was just the studio sitting around playing multiplayer and trying things out and just having a blast. Um, 
And and I, I can't even remember what some of those maps were like, but some of them were really crazy. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, what was like, what maps that are in that were shipped with Halo 1 were kind of in the early prototype stage? Do you, were there like the, you know, the early ancestors of Hang'em High or anything like that? No. No, I think to me, the thing that people don't realize about Halo's development was just how little of it we had when we <laughs> went to Macworld. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, we, you, what you saw at Macworld was everything we had. Yeah, basically. that was the multiplayer map. Um, so why show it so early? Is that coming down from Apple or just from Bungie, like the top of Bungie saying we got to show something? Well, uh, the way that happened was we had something we thought was going to be cool. We, we uh, Halo was starting to turn into something that the, the main thing was you could go from inside to outside. You could have expanses uh, that we did with skies and and rivers and vehicles, but you could start inside someplace and just seamlessly run outside. And then, of course, you had fun multiplayer and warthog physics. So that's all we had. And... Um, I think Joe's, at the time, Joe Staten's girlfriend, Susan Lusty, was a PR person who got this opportunity and said, hey, guys, Bungie, if you want, I can put you on stage at Macworld New York with Steve Jobs, but you have to have something to show. So it was like, yeah, we got something to show. Of course, we had nothing to show. Yeah. So I think within about it, we had to, that whole thing was scripted and scored and put together with, you know, chewing gum and bailing wire in like a weekend, uh, maybe just a little bit more than a weekend. And that was it. We showed everything we had. I'm trying to remember what was the soundtrack like for that first video? Oh, <laughs> yeah. you, just, you just open it, open it up, open the door right there for that. Well, what was funny is, uh, well, it's funny to me, is uh, Joe Staten came and Jason and said, you know, here's this, we're going to do this demo, but we're showing it on the Mac, which was OpenGL. And at that point, we hadn't developed the sound engine for the Macintosh yet. So I said, we don't have any ability to do sound. And Joe was like, well, maybe Jason can just narrate the whole time. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, no, that's horrible. <laughs> um, and, and so I said, let me let me do a soundtrack. I'll just do a music track. We'll play it on a CD and we'll just try to sync it up. And that's what we did. So I convinced them, like, look, let's really blow this thing out. Macworld is a great venue. There's a cap in captive audience in the dark uh, introduced by Steve Jobs. I mean, the, the master of... Uh, Smoke and mirrors, I guess. <laughs> I think we can say that. Rest, rest is <laughs> sure. rest, rest in peace. Uh, but he, you know, he, uh, you know, to put on a good show was really important. So I said, I'll come up with a, a music track and I'll try to sync it to whatever your scripted thing is, and we'll hope for the best. And that's almost exactly what we did. So I, I did the. That's where the monks came from, and the you know, the cello theme. It's just, it's the main Halo theme that everybody knows. I mean, we used it forever. It's so um, interesting to me to think that one of those recognizable pieces of music in all of gaming is structured in a way just to time for one trailer that probably exactly. shouldn't have been shown. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, I mean, the, I remember when I was working on it, I would say to Joe, how long is this demo? And he says, oh, two or three minutes. I'm like, Joe, that... Two or three minutes, that's a huge difference. <laughs> so I said, what's it going to be like? And he says, well, it'll sort of start off mysterious and then kind of end mysterious. And I thought, okay, so I'll just do something that I call smushy, you know, at the beginning and something sort of smushy at the end and have something really driving in the middle. But I knew that once I saw how long it could be, I could change, you know, the durations if I needed to at the last minute. So that's where the monks came from and the sort of mysterious beginning and we, we start with the monks, end with the monks, and have the chugging orchestra in the middle. How do you feel about that theme these days, Marty? I, 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 still, still, I, still, I still love it. I have a huge fondness in my heart that uh, I love the way it came together. I never thought it was going to be anything more than just that show. Uh, and the fact that it actually has turned into something iconic is, uh, you know, that's that's great. You don't get many of those. That's amazing. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it wasn't just the music either. I mean, well, I, of course not. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think the Warthog was actually a huge part of the plan until, um, you know, people saw it and they started obsessing over it. And I think like Penny Arcade had a whole comic 
about it and everybody just kind of glommed onto that vehicle even more than any of the characters or anything and so we knew okay well whatever we're making it's going to have the i think we just called it the jeep at the time yeah <laughs> it was right. have the warthog so jamie what was your actual title on halo one then um uh designer like i said the i mean the team was so small i was literally the only dedicated designer on it um until we moved out to microsoft and so what was the decision behind the switch from third person to first person uh you know i think there's definitely some challenges um making third person work with sort of the accuracy and um and kind of especially in co a competitive game that, that you want uh that we wanted um that was definitely Jason Jones's decision to go from third person to first person. Um, and I, I think one of the things people don't realize is that Destiny followed that exact same path. Like there was a playable version of Destiny in third person for a year at least before it was decided to go back to first person. Um, and then so that's why actually I was so psyched to work on Infamous because I'm like, all right. I get to do a third person camera for real this time. Like there's no way that infamous is going to be a first person. Game. We're changing our minds six months away from release. We're going yeah. first person with infamous. Yeah. It'd be easier. Well, and the thing that I also loved about early halo days where it was not only the seamless transition from inside to outside and the vast expanses that we saw, but, um, jumping into the warthog, you know, and the driver position or the gunner position or the passenger that was all seamless also. And you went, from first person into this third person Jeep view, mm -hmm. all seamlessly and 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 it just felt so good. And so um, as a gamer myself, I was like, that's what I've been looking for. I love that the, the, the ability to transition between all those things without feeling any, you know, jolts or, you know, black loading screens or anything. I love that. So where does this whole thing come from? Where's the motivation to do something so new and technically groundbreaking at the time? Oh, you mean back then? Yeah, yeah, for, for Halo 1. I mean, was it just a real groundswell of talent and passion within the studio, or was it just the perfect time in the industry to create that seamlessness? Yeah, I think it was completely my idea, if I remember correctly. Oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> I remember the meeting where you suggested yes. that. <laughs> uh, yeah, that I, I wasn't at any of those meetings. I just got to participate and see how cool it was. So Sure. I think a lot of, a lot of Halo 1 was timing. A lot of it was, you know, the right hardware, the right team, the right idea, the right backing, you know, it was, it's, that's, um, you know, we've definitely had people ask like, is Highwire going to try to recreate the Halo days? And like, you couldn't do that if you tried. It's, it's 50% showing up and 50% luck. Um, so we're just trying to make a place where we can have fun making games the same way we had fun making games and the rest of it will take care of itself or, or not, you know, we're, right. we're definitely not, not, not counting on repeating that arc. Although I do, I would have to say though, that both Jamie and I and Jared, I think we're always intrigued by, you know, anything that's sort of cutting edge or, you know, new technologies that, in, in all areas that maybe haven't quite, you know, figured out how to prove that they're um, compelling. Mm -hmm. And so if there's something we can do to, to you know, I'm going to give Jace, uh, Jamie some real kudos here. Uh, the the switch from uh, the PC slash Mac version of Halo to the Xbox version, suddenly doing that same thing on a console, that was a really scary transition. I love the idea of going to the Xbox because of, you know, the fidelity of, of sound and surround sound and all the rest of it. And I was like, yeah, this is a no-brainer for me. But as a as a first person shooting game, um, that was a real scary moment because we, you know, this was a brand new console that it wasn't proven. Mm -hmm. And how do you do this really? As you know, we were all um, Half Life players, and you know, how do you do this on a console? Yeah, mm -hmm. Jamie, so you're you're a big Jamie. Jamie's the one. Well, I, he may not be the only one, but he certainly was in the trenches figuring out how to make that work. Yeah. So Jamie, I mean, you are such a big control and feel guy. That seems to be your emphasis if I know you correctly. Yeah. 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 Okay. It's so what, can you talk about those decisions for mapping out the controls for Halo 1 on the Xbox? Did you look to any other games as inspiration or where did that come yeah, from? Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, before we, before we move on, Jared uh, Noftal is our, the third kind of 
founding member of yeah. Highwire. So he could be right there. <laughs> who's uh, in Africa right now, yeah. so he can't be here. But. And he's, he's from, he's coming from Airtight, is that correct? Airtight. So that's the last yeah, okay. so yeah, he was the tech director over there, and he's going to be the tech director at Highwire. Neither yeah. of us can code, as okay. we, you know, admitted to you before, <laughs> and that's, that's Jared's real strength. So oh, cool. When we were looking for a third person to kind of augment this 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 pair, then uh, Jared came to mind right away. But sure. um, yeah, the the transition was a big deal because um, when you're using a mouse, you're it's it's kind of absolute positioning. You know, if you want to look to the right, you just move the the mouse directly to the right. Mm -hmm. Whereas the controller is more of a timing based, right? So if you want to look three you know, three inches or whatever to the right, that you have to translate that into how long do I hold the right stick? And so helping people finagle that time so it was exactly right and finagle the direction so it was exactly right. I mean, at the time, there were shooters that came out using two sticks. And one stick would move you forward and turn you, and the other stick would um, move you left and right and look up and down. I mean, it was it was inherited from Goldeneye. And yeah, so, right. uh, you know, coming from the PC world, we were like, this is ridiculous. I can't even figure out how to do this. <laughs> and so um, we had to kind of um, bring people along into this new world where the right stick completely just controls the camera. I'm trying to remember. I think Time Splitters 1 controlled that way. Did you look at that game at all? Time Splitters 1 had... It, it didn't by default control that way ah. because it was from the, you know, some of the GoldenEye team. Sure. Um, but didn't, didn't they come out after Halo or not? No, it came out, it came out a little bit before, but, oh, okay. yeah. um, but you could go in and change things around so that it would be, and we already, we were already using those Halo controls, but we did take time splitters into the lab and like test and see where people had problems with it. Um, they weren't doing any of the aim assistance that Halo does. And so it was what people expected on a controller. You know, it was just hard and clunky. Uh, but yeah, we, we definitely, that was one of our um, good kind of playtest lab experiences that, that got us to the point where we could ship. Right. Yeah, and Jamie was uh, you. You really pioneered the playtest lab back then. That was uh, give me a little bit more credit well, for a lot I mean, of things. What I mean is, you were so handsome back then too. Lot. <laughs> so it, there was Microsoft had a, a really nice playtest lab, which we never had, you know, in Chicago. So uh, we were right across the parking lot from the Microsoft. I think they called them usability labs at the time, and we were fortunate because there were a whole bunch of Xbox launch titles, and they would book time right in the lab and then i would get a call on a friday and that and and um you know one of the guys over there would be like hey azarek like didn't get us a build we've got all these third person adventure gamers coming in over the weekend <laughs> do you want them to test halo and we'd be like yeah let me just throw something together and so we got you know 10 times the amount of testing as anybody else just from being in close proximity and for the record, I finished Azeric, just so you know. <laughs> well, we were proud. throwing shade on Azeric. Just <laughs> on. <laughs> Classic. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, the kind of legend goes, and you can correct the legend here, sure. uh, is that Microsoft didn't have too much faith in Halo uh, early in its development. It was just like, yeah, we're developing this first-person game. What are you going to do? And then it came out, and it's like, oh, Jesus. Put all our <laughs> chips on this Halo thing. Is there truth to that? What was it like working with Microsoft back in those days? I think that the the executives like Ed Freeze um, and his crew that were leading Xbox, they got it. That's why they brought us out. But yeah, I remember being in a meeting where marketing told us that it's like, so Bloodwake is getting this amount of money and you guys are going to be somewhere like less than that. And then, you know, and and just thinking... Bloodwake, you guys are back in the wrong horse. Uh, Rod in Ferguson enough, from enough, uh, Epic. Marketing dollars was not, you know, the big deal. Well, as a matter of fact, I still remember, and I think this was a meeting you and I were at, where we were the only guys that went to this PR presentation slash marketing meeting from whoever they had hired as an outside contractor. And uh, they went through this really great presentation of how they had tested the early version of Halo on the Xbox, and here's what the here's what these people said, and here's what the users all decided. And they said, you know, 
the one thing we can tell you, I mean, you're, everything you guys are doing is really good and it's great, but the one thing for sure you have to change is it can't be called Halo. <laughs> you just cannot call call this game Halo. It's too wussy sounding, yeah. Bad. So we were like, oh, well, okay, bye. <laughs> Let's be clear. Marty and I were not, we were grounded and they sent us to that meeting. <laughs> that was not like, we were the only ones privileged enough to be there. It was like, no, no, no. we got to send somebody that That's can right. talk to these guys. So you guys are <laughs> nominated. Yeah. And it just was funny though. Those, they, they built up to this climax where they said, the one thing you have to change is the name of the game. It can't be called Halo. Oh yeah. So, the, which is why so, eventually, it, that's why the combat evolved came. Okay. So it was a compromise. Yeah. So, okay. Okay. You met him in the middle where it's like, we'll call we'll, we'll get, get across that you're going to be fighting things, but we're still more, hanging out of Halo. We told them, can I swear on this podcast? <laughs> yeah, go for it. Please. <laughs> we told them to bleep off. Oh. And they said, well, we're printing up the box, so we'll put on it what we want to put on it. And they, and so I think the compromise was like uh, Combat Evolved was on the box, but not in the game. <laughs> Bizarre. All right. The other story I want from you, Jamie, about Halo 1 is it has the greatest weapon of all time, which is the Halo 1 pistol. You must have been involved in the fine tuning of that thing. I'm sure you've told this saga a thousand oh, times. It was not. That was yes, the problem. That was the problem. This is Jason Ooh. Jones all about. Uh -oh. Go ahead. Ah, I'm sensitive. Uh, no, 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 no. I, <laughs> I, um, so, I mean, you got to understand, like, um, there were serious meetings two months before we shipped about cutting multiplayer. There was, a, there was a, there was a meeting that I was in that was like, okay, we can either have the sniper rifle or the shotgun. Which one should we have? And I said, uh, the sniper rifle. And then I went to my desk and I accumulated like the kind of skunk works resources to make sure that the shotgun got in, even though we told them that we had just cut it. Cause and you're running out like, of time or what is the issue? Uh, yeah, it was time. I mean, the, the ship date was not going to change. And, um, it was, it was, it was like a crazy short, development for what we actually shipped once we all moved out to seattle i think it was like nine months yeah it was, under, it was it was less insane. than a year yeah less than a year of real development on the xbox and this was when a console game could not get patched like that was not a thing back then and so um we had had uh for a long time the 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 single player weapons and the multiplayer weapons were the same okay and then um those got split uh, so that we could balance them separately. And the multiplayer balance kind of got crazy um, where, uh, it, I mean, maybe it was balanced, but it was so different than what I was doing over on the single player side that the rec the weapons were kind of unrecognizable and they would do totally different things. And so we said, okay, we, we can't do that. So we reflattened it out so that they matched the single player again and started tuning again and this was i mean literally we're, we're, we're down to the wire um and uh we built the final release candidate right and that involves a lot of um, processing of files and you take all the all the data that used to be kind of strewn around in multiple files and you pack it into these big cache files and um and it was like the last play test on the last day uh, and I was exhausted. I worked, I worked like 72 hours straight and I, and I was like, this is great. Ship it and let's go home. I came back in the next day and to find out that they had decided not to change the cache files because that was too risky. Like we were beyond the last minute, but to in the code, go in and change one, one multiple number. Value of like it would just like go in, and as soon as you started the game, it would like overwrite that value in memory. And that one value was the multiplier on how much damage a headshot did. And we had talked before about maybe upping it a little bit, but I think I swear they just got the math wrong <laughs> and ended up taking like removing two shots from how many shots it was supposed to take to, to kill you. Um, is this was, from like, is it from like a late play test where it's like, well, this is imbalanced very last second. Let's change it. Or where's that motivation coming from? Um, I think, I think part of it was like, 
some people had been working on the single player and had not been playing multiplayer and they just got involved and everybody was exhausted and you know who knows right and i but i think um yeah it, it happened like at two in the morning eight or eight or nine hours after we were supposed to be done and everybody had gone home uh and then we shipped it and it was like well i think this was a like a medium-sized mistake <laughs> but i actually didn't expect it to impact the game too much because i mean this is a game with rocket launchers and grenades in it who would have think that like a pistol would change that much um and then and even for the first few weeks after we came out you know people look at it and go it's a pistol oh, i'll replace it with this rifle you know it didn't really it took a while for people to kind of figure out to figure out how to use that pistol like insane the, the the really good players that figured out how to yeah. use the pistol above everything else was yeah. amazing Is that and then fire rate exploits too where you yeah. didn't have to reload and yeah it just got worse and worse it was some, something to do with the fire rate and just like that just the right amount of zoom sweet spot and the reticle <laughs> yeah. is just the right size of a spartan head at the right distance just the good old three shot and run away. It's, it's so good it's yeah. also amazing that like two of the most important console games for like console multiplayer fps like goldeneye almost didn't have multiplayer at all and then yeah, just right. hearing you know from you that that halo made it so far along and that 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 choice almost had to be made between single player and multiplayer it's insane where would we be now you know, so that's where you're saying every game in the future should have multiplayer just in case one revolutionizes we, the entire industry. We went through that phase in the industry already. <laughs> if you're, so, if you're yeah. almost about to cut multiplayer, don't. Exactly. Because <laughs> right. you'll be a revolutionary game. Yeah, because we could be playing Bioshock multiplayer right now. That's right. I mean, that's who right. Knows? Bioshock 2 had it. They nailed it. I mean, yeah, yeah. Infinite was right there. It was yeah. ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so bizarre now. So, what was it like then on, internally when every Halo was developed after that? And everyone's like, just bring back the pistol. It's like, we're not going to go back to that mistake. It could, was it tough to try and convince the fans that that shouldn't have happened because everyone grew so attached to that thing? Um, it was so so internally, like probably uh, I don't know, a month and a half after Halo One shipped, we were starting to talk about Halo Two. I just went in and I took the took a took the model for the assault rifle and put it into the the tags for the pistol and said. There's nothing wrong with this weapon. Maybe it's a little bit overpowered, but it's dumb that it's a pistol because, you know, when you're first playing, you're getting destroyed and you have no idea because it looks like, you know, it's a pistol. The affordance is not there for you to know that this is the most powerful weapon in the game. I was like, so we don't have to, we don't have to fix it. We just have to make the model look more like a devastating, like, headshot cannon instead of <laughs> uh, the sidearm that you toss away as soon as you can. Uh -huh. um, and, and then we took the assault rifle and we made it into a, some machine gun, um, and and honestly, that's pretty close to what we shipped for Halo Two. Oh, that's bizarre. But, okay, but yeah, the fans. I think that they eventually got it. A lot of people actually Halo Two was their first Halo multiplayer, and so they were like, "Oh, we're battle rifle people. Like, don't take our battle rifle away." And then now you've got, you know, and then the DMR came out, and it's like everybody has this. They're all the same weapon underneath. <laughs> right. There's there's very 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 small changes, but um, for the vast majority of people that play, like they're just cosmetic. But that has a huge impact on how people perceive a, a, a weapon. Definitely. So a lot of people look at, I guess I want to call call it the early days of Bungie. I guess it's kind of the middle aged Bungie. I guess ultimately. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they want to look back at that era and see kind of like the magic bullet. Like, oh, this was their secret to success. I think a lot of people, maybe because he doesn't do too many interviews, assumes that Jason Jones uh, is just like a convulsing brain that's flying around the studio, perfecting everything. I mean, do you guys consider Jason a genius or is maybe um, that logic of that's the reason Bungie succeeded so much during that era overblown? Uh, there's no there's no question that Jason is genius. Like he taught me everything I know about game design. Um, and he, that was, he was at, like kind of peak Jason back in those days. Um, just so much energy and he had his hands in every pie. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. But I think, um, you know, the team that shipped destiny is, you know, 10 to 20 times larger than the team that shipped Halo one. And so any one guy is going to have less impact, uh, on, on a game that size. I, I think you kind of see it. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, it's like I, I sort of see Bungie in, in the sort of, you know, beginning, middle and, and, and later stages or present stage. It is a three part thing. 
I was going to say beginning, middle, and end. I didn't forget that. (laughs) Uh, But like there really is that sort of beginning stage through the, you know, pre-Microsoft. And then there was the Microsoft Halo decade. And then there's the, you know, today, the Destiny era. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's interesting how much, how much influence Jason had, of course, from the beginning. Jason was the founder with Alex uh, of, of the first Bungie. I mean, that's no doubt about it. The second Bungie, the Halo Bungie, um, hugely, you know, huge influence, especially on Halo 1. And and then on Halo 2, it was just, I mean, you've seen all the, maybe maybe you haven't, but there, you know, it's been well documented that Halo 2 had some of its, uh, some difficulties during development. But Jason was sort of on it, and then he was off of it. He he wanted to do this other project, so he had you know Halo Two went on its own for a while, and then he came back to it. Yeah. And then I think he really sort of got tired of like, do I still want to keep doing this? So he he really kind of went away for a while. He he was like you know he wasn't he wasn't that much involved in the Halo Three ODST reach. So the the last three uh, Halo games. Um, were not games that, that Jason was intimately involved in. Uh, when he came back, it was like he wanted to come back to starting to do something new, and he started working on Destiny, early, early, early stuff on Destiny, even in 19, or 19, what was it, 2008? Um, no, eight. Is that how early that was? Yeah. Oh, my wow. gosh. Well, you guys- so, um, I yeah, think, it's just that Jason uh, just to be has, clear, a, has a, a huge influence on the studio, but not necessarily on every single title and every right. single detail. Yeah. This is sort of like going um, going to your hometown and talking to a couple of your ex girlfriends and saying, "So, what's Ben like?" You know, it's we're not the most, uh, <laughs> don't like, do that. Uh, dis- dispassionate, disconnected, true, objective true. sources. Right. But I think also that Halo One team had the most like talent density that I have ever seen in my career. Like so many people on that team turned out to be superstars. And a lot of it was, you know, it was a lot of people's first game, right? So there was no way you could have known that it was going to happen. It just, you know, some combination of luck and good recruiting and good development, like that team was incredibly talented and it's, it's since spread out and there's lots of games that are, you know, have been kind of driven by, people that were on that original team. Yeah, yeah, and and to try to 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 single out why there was a, you know, what the magic bullet is or where the magic sauce comes from. I think that's just that's it's a fun thought, you know, experiment, but it, it just doesn't it, you're going to get a different answer from anybody who was on that team and mm-hmm. so many different people contributed in such tiny subtle ways that turned out to be like huge, you know, huge things that nobody predicted. Um and somebody will argue with me about that too. But I mean, there are, I, I know for a fact there are some really cool things that ended up shipping in Halo 1 that it were never in a design doc and just sort of magically appeared, uh, organically appeared. So that's fun. Right. I like that. Yeah, definitely. So throughout uh, your stints at Bungie, where would you say was like the lowest morale? Was it the development of Halo 2, like you talked about before? Marty, you might have a different story. <laughs> this, is a, this is a dark we place. We won't go into my story or Jamie's story, but uh, at le- I would say at least in the development of the Halo series, which sure. is probably the best place to be. Um, Halo 2 almost killed me. Yeah, Halo 2 almost killed everybody in the studio. There was a wow. point where it was unbelievable. I it, mean, it just was horrible. Yeah. I worked uh, probably 14 hours a day, seven days a week for going on two years on that game. Jeez. And I, and and there were guys there when I got there, and they were still there when I left. And it was just... Is it because that Microsoft had the financial eye of Sauron looking at Halo at this point? No, and- we did it to ourselves. We did it to ourselves. We we got arrogant and, and kind of um, bit off way, way more <laughs> technically than we could chew, artistically than we could chew, design-wise more than we could chew, um, and didn't have any kind of discipline um and it yeah it, it, it very nearly wrecked the whole studio i mean I, almost everything that's happened since then you can trace back to halo 2 and it's sort of become it's a re- like a reaction to how halo 2 went off the rails what do you mean by that just as far as structuring teams and the process yeah yeah or or you know um like involving more production staff or what deals do we sign or what do we speak about publicly or how do we do an E3 demo or 
you know, I mean, all the way down to like design details about scope and mission size and things like that. It's a lot of, especially for the, for the first couple of years after Halo 2, it was kind of, all right, we were wounded and, and on death's door, like whatever happens, we can't do that again. Because people, people would see it coming and they would, I mean, the team would have just dissolved overnight, I think. Mm. Yeah, and I would say, you know, one of the one of the amazing things about the Halo 2 process was we 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 knew we had this reputation for doing an E3 presentation or a you know a trailer or something that that captured the fans' imaginations. And now Halo was this it was an, a success right away, but then it kept growing and becoming sort of a mega success and we were tasked with outdoing that. And then there was also the, oh, well, now we're going to finally have Xbox Live, and we were supposed to be a launch title for Xbox Live, and it was that was just impossible. Mm -hmm. So we knew that we were going to be a year after Xbox, Xbox Live came out, but we knew that people were really waiting to be able to play Halo multiplayer um, on Xbox Live. So we, you know, that first trailer that we did, um, and then the, I, especially the E3 demo that we did, that was a live gameplay demo, which we worked like crazy on. Oh, I thought you were about to say it was a lie. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a lie. That was really gameplay, real gameplay trailer where the, you know, dual wielding was showing up and the, you know, boarding of the, of the ghost and kicking the brute out of there and all those different things that we showed at that thing. Um, including this lighting model that we had, we worked so hard to make that be, you know, a thing that the fans just would just salivate over after they saw it. Um, but when we came back from that, we realized that was not shippable. We couldn't actually take that and make a game out of it. It was, we had just bit off more than we could chew. And that was a giant uh, kick in the kick in the rear because like, wow, we just showed the fans a bunch of stuff. How are we going to pay off that and still recover and still mm -hmm. have a great game? It was yeah. it was amazing. And then at the end of that entire road, I remember there was that crazy French leak of the game. <laughs> was it like, it felt like, was it a month before the game came out? Something it was a like while that? before, yeah. And it must have been devastating wow. for the team. Uh I was in a coma, <laughs> so I don't. Yeah, that's true. I don't have any long-term memories of any of that. Yeah, because you actually, you know, we we're done. We take our hands off the game a good thirty to forty days before it's actually on the shelves. So yeah, I mean that 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 almost broke everybody in the studio. I mean, we had to throw so much away and almost start over from scratch after the E3 demo. Mm -hmm. um, all the design, yeah. all the, the engine, just all sorts of stuff. We just realized that we had written a check we couldn't cash that had to do with frame rate and everything else. So, I mean, it was uh, pretty devastating. Yeah. I was at that E3, and I didn't give the demo on the stage, uh, but the, we had a theater that we would run, I don't know, 40 people through every yeah. 15 minutes. Dual so screen. I gave that demo over and over and over and over. Uh, and, you know, to see people like light up when you would board the ghost and kick the brood out of it. And, and so I was kind of euphoric at the end of that. And then to come back and everybody had been stewing for a week on, we're cutting everything. And <laughs> it's a disaster. Like that, that was probably the lowest point. That yeah. was horrible. It was pretty bad. Oh man, that's just well on it some more. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. We can move to something a little more uplifting. But Jamie, well, I uh, tell you this at Bungie, that is the whenever we would would talk about anything at Bungie, it was like, well, we let's not does not we can't do the Halo Two crunch. You know? Sure. Well, this is starting to feel like the Halo Two crunch yeah, and yeah. stuff. And it was just, it was a lesson learned. Yeah, um, every studio has to go through that at some point, right? I think so. Maybe not so severe, but yeah. <laughs> right. So Jamie, recently on Twitter, uh, you were talking about how much you wanted to cut. Uh, split screen. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk about those debates internally? Um, so, uh, Twitter, right? So specifically, <laughs> I was arguing... Good. I'm not the one in trouble. I like that. <laughs> I was arguing for cutting four-player co-op split screen. Okay. Um, because we were starting to run into a lot of problems on the mission side where... Um, and this is on Halo 3 specifically? Yeah, Halo okay. 3. Yeah. Where, um, you know, if one person went left and 
another person went right and another person went straight, pretty soon you've got three players worth of AI triggered and physics simulation running and sound design. Yeah. And, and <laughs> people like eating up sound channels left and right. And, and, and you end up having to make all kinds of compromises on the mission design front. Uh, and we were already really pushing the hardware. And so then we would be getting back bug after bug after bug of this mission's great except for on split screen when this person gets in the warthog and this person gets in a banshee and they fly at opposite ends of the world and um, don't do that <laughs> and so yeah I and mean, i was definitely on the side of look let's just let's just simplify our lives let's optimize for the case of one or two players and not worry so much about everything else um and I think my my argument was let's just let the frame rate go to hell, <laughs> uh, which you know was responded to. Well, we can't do that. I'm like, all right, fine. Let's just limit the number of players on one box to two. Um, and that was too early, I think. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that was there was still a lot of people playing it that way. It, I don't I don't actually think it was the right call, but I I do understand why the 343 guys, I mean, they're facing all the exact same problems and I I can absolutely, and they have a better alternative, which is play it over live. So I can absolutely see why they made that call. Yeah, definitely. Do you guys, how much do you follow 343's work? Uh, We're still fans of the series and of the team and we got a lot of friends over there. So pretty closely, but not, you know, I, it's kind of a, a treat to get to play a Halo game when it comes out and not know what's going to happen. So yeah. try not to follow it too closely. Yeah, I saw Frankie at uh, E3 this year, and, and uh, it was funny because I had my own little tweet that was hinting that I was going to bring some new business cards to E3, and that's all I said. And apparently enough people were like, oh, 343, Marty's going to have 343 business cards, which I wasn't. I wasn't trying to intimate that at all. I wasn't uh-huh. trying to hint at anything. But apparently, Frankie Frank O'Connor got all sorts of uh, flooded in mail uh, in inbox uh, with with rec- you know questions about that. So yeah, he had to do some damage control. He had to do some damage control. So so he had to like tweet out to everybody that like he was hoping that you know whatever Marty was doing was going to be cool, but it wasn't at three four three. And and uh, I was like, hey, thanks Frank for the <laughs> for the tweet that got you know all sorts of people looking at what we were doing. I can't imagine after you left Bungie, you didn't at least have a discussion with 343 though marty <laughs> certainly <laughs> something was communicated talk about that there's so many not, things i can't talk about but not, anyway yeah not because it's a secret no um that he is that's not that's not the case uh-huh. um, but i i mean i definitely did when i left but i i don't i didn't have anything else to say about halo like there was no other interesting direction like i had mined it completely at the end of halo 3 and i even i remember marty and i sitting out in a parking lot and i'm saying i I can't work on halo anymore like i don't Mm -hmm. somebody else needs to take over and do what they want to do because i i got nothing um and so i I actually didn't work on odst or reach i moved on to destiny that's right what would eventually become destiny like right after that and it was fun though i mean to to work on i i really thought we had said everything we wanted to say for halo um at halo 3 uh but odst there was a whole bunch of reasons why that even came into being that was not really planned it's very confusing how that game was rolled out yeah right and and that's a whole other story which we won't go into right now but what i really like is in hindsight it's still one of my my favorite halo games it was a, supposed to be Halo 3 ODST. It was an expansion. Mm-hmm. Uh, we certainly never planned on someone releasing it as a launch or as a Christmas title. Um, but, but you got to be a little more experimental fall. with the soundtrack with that one in particular. Yeah, and it just was like it was just a little bit surprising to me because it was a different story. There was no Master Chief, no Cortana. Uh, it took place in you know one day and one night and flashbacks and stuff like that and. And because of the city and the film noir feel, and it was very self-contained, and um, I really just enjoyed how that all came together and and the way it is. So even playing it again now, I'm like, it's still a little gem in my opinion. Yeah. Then Reach was actually, I think, um, they just re-released that one. 
I don't know if you know ODST. Yes, I do know that. Yes. <laughs> uh, but uh, with Reach, uh, it was another one of those, wow, let's, you know, no Master Chief in Reach either, except mm -hmm. at the very end of the game. And it's so it's this interesting uh, prequel that told a tragic story. And, you know, it was just a different feel for the whole game. So we really, you know, we did th three like mainstream Halos and then ODST and Reach were really kind of in a different vein. And, and I'm curious, I feel, like, that, I feel like there's this divide in the Halo fan base. Um, there's a lot of passionate fans out there that really love the first three Halos in particular. And I'm curious where you guys fall down the spectrum in terms of how ambitious you want 343 to be with the Halo design and kind of framework, or would you prefer they be more conservative and kind of harken back to the earlier days? I would, uh, to be, I, I would not try to tell them I don't even have an opinion about what they should do, frankly. I mean, and not because I'm being mean, but it's like, yeah. like they have to, in my, I've talked to the, some of the folks over there and I'm, I'm really encouraging that they make their own way, have their own voice, figure out, you know, it's, it's, it's wonderful to see a franchise or a, a you know, a property that, that we are so intimately involved in making and starting off. Uh, but it's continues, you know, it continues in so many different ways and it's great to see it go and it's going to go in whatever direction the new aesthetic people and the artists and the designers want it to go. Sometimes it might be, you know, might surpass anything that we ever imagined. Sometimes it might take a sideways step, but I mean, I, I just want them to do what they feel artistically uh, right about. So, And keep yeah. in mind in Halo 5, they are using the Halo 1 theme again. Have you heard that? I someone told me that honest, I'll be honest with you I have not heard that that's what they're doing so that's kind of interesting I hadn't heard that yet either yeah that's yeah a, apparently that's, that's a big exciting bullet for me. point for yes. them is like Halo yeah. themes coming back right. baby <laughs> I for me I, I've, I've I've talked to those guys I'm friends with a bunch of those guys and I'm like dude run with it like yeah. like go for it I, I mean my biggest problem as a designer is that I never saw a solution that I wanted to re-implement right I, like i I'm always like, I had this brand new idea on how to do this thing. And then, you know, the, the engineer would be like, but we, that works already. We, it, it's already fine. I'm like, yeah, but this is a new way of doing it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, for me, Halo needs to evolve. Uh, to and by the way, this is why our third guy is here, Jared, is to like tamp some of that down. That's true. <laughs> I mean, there's no, there's some, uh, Jamie and I go back and I, we've, we've had arguments over the years, always friendly arguments, but like, Jamie, we've we've already done the sound design for the plasma rifle, and it works at the speed that you gave it to us. Stop speeding it up and slowing it down because it start, it breaks sound design. Goes, no, no, I'm still experimenting with it. It was like, no, we're about to ship. We're shipping tomorrow. Stop changing it. Yeah, and even on a larger scale, like I, I think the the surest way that they could fail would be to look backwards, and and try to. You can't walk forward while you're looking backward. Right. You're gonna you're gonna fall every time and so smart. they need to make a bet and hopefully it's a big bet and from what i've seen they're making some pretty on the gameplay side some pretty cool big bets and you know succeed or fail at least it'll be interesting and worth talking about and Definitely. not oh yeah they're just trying to play on my nostalgia and these are all dated game mechanics and, right you know. before we leave you guys marty i wanted to talk to you a little bit because last time i think we visited you well i guess it's saw e3 last year but Last time I saw you before that was on the Destiny cover story trip uh, a couple of years ago, and you were so excited about the music of the Spheres concert. Can you talk about that at all? Oh, you're breaking up. Oh, oh damn. Is, is, there, is there any oh, chance? I can't. Oh, oh damn God. it. Is there any chance people will ever be able to hear that entire album's worth of music? Oh, I can't. Oh, <laughs> hold on. I can't. So on a small studio, uh -huh. um, Sometimes the designers have to be the PR people. <laughs> what? Well. And if we had a PR person, they would have hung up on you uh, at this okay. point. Just so you know. Let me just say. No, there's no. Always a hang on. He's just going to say something. And you can't do that. <laughs> just banging on a keyboard? Okay. A smile and a nod from Marty or a head shake. I can't quite make it out. And All a right. wink. And a wink. All right, cool. Well, I think that's a wink is a good place well, to it, end this whole for thing. asking, Ben. <laughs> yeah, what are you going to do? So. Thanks, guys. Hey, yeah. I got to say, big fan of the show. I, I love uh, kind of the tone you guys set. And oh, thanks. thank you. 
put the focus on the the developers. It's I I, I always I always download and listen. So oh, well, really appreciate it. As our first developer fan for the new it's Game Informer show, much appreciated. Yeah, so. yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for joining us for an extended interview. Uh, yeah. Really appreciate your guys' time and the listeners' time. Yeah, really excited to see what comes out of Highware in the future. Um, that's Good. super Thanks. cool. And, you guys and are... if people are excited, I'm going to be the PR guy again. Yeah. If people are excited, they can follow us at Highwire underscore games on Twitter. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Maybe we can talk again in the future sometime when you got more to, <laughs> to say about what you're working on. I would love cool. it. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much for watching or listening to this episode of the Game Informer Show. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Thank you.